The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, every more, everybody. Um, I was going to say good morning. It's afternoon for some of us. Good morning to the West Coast. It is our 11th annual in-house creative industry benchmarking webinar. Sophie and I are really excited to be here today. I'm mostly excited because my kids are finally back in school, um, but also because the year 2020, it was crazy. It was trying. It was challenging. But we're going to tell you a story, which for us, the headline is 2020 was the year of the in-house agency. The results that we're going to be sharing today tell the story of in-house agencies that persevered, teams that were called upon in new ways, limits that were tested, and success that was garnered. So despite everything, 2020, it was a year in which in-house agencies won. For those of you I've not had yet had the pleasure to meet, I'm Jackie Schaefer, Sella's Executive Vice President. And joining me today is Sophie Regulus. Sophie's been with us for a little over two years now, and she leads our consulting practice. This is her webinar debut, and I really love the dot she's going to connect for us between what we learned in the 2020 survey and where the marketing and in-house industry is going. Thanks, Jackie. Happy to be here and looking forward to today. Great. So before we dig in, there's some things I want to remind you guys. There's actually kind of a big thing. Um, and for some of you, perhaps share it with you for the first time. But in 2020, February 2020, before the world got turned upside down, we here at Zella, we did a little thing. It was actually a big thing. We combined three of our former brands, the Boss Group, Proposal Development Consultants, and Zella Consulting into one brand, Zella. And it was an incredibly exciting time for us. That decision was rooted in what we've been hearing or had been hearing from our customers for years. A desire to access the three solutions you see here on screen, consulting, staffing, managed services or solutions in a more unified way. So now creative marketing and digital leaders like yourselves can view Sella as your end-to-end -end solutions partner. Our mission statement is together we put passion to work. I think you might agree with me that this space that we all get to work in, creative marketing and digital, People who work in this space are passionate professionals. We do what we love. We're fortunate enough to be paid for it. And this past year underscored the truth that we all put our own passion to work every day. Across the next 45 minutes or so, Sophie and I are gonna share with you some background on the survey that we've been doing, um, the changes we made in it this year. We'll go through kind of an executive summary, what our key takeaways are. Uh, trends. We're going to look at 2021 versus 2016. Where do we see kind of some big jumps and, and new starts for the future? Then we're going to look at the continued impact of 20 or of COVID-19 rather. And then what's next for in-house agencies? Where are we going? Then we'll have Q&A. So following that presentation, like I said, Sophie and I are going to talk for about 45 minutes. Um, and then you, either throughout the presentation or at the end of the presentation, just pop your questions into that questions panel at the bottom of your GoToWebinar control panel. All right, this survey, I wanna thank everyone. Every year I start by this because it really is important to me and important to Stella and important to your peers. Thank you for uh, taking time. And on average, it took you guys 25 minutes to do this survey. You either did it in December or January. Um, and it's intense, the survey. It's 130 questions. And it, that's only though, if you answer every question, you know, there's definitely routing and uh, logic that takes you through the questions that apply to your group. But I wanna, again, just underscore, it's your participation that makes this a success every single year. You see 12 areas that we survey on. And in the lower right, I wanna point out the COVID-19 impact. You may recall last year, we launched a separate survey, right? Cause we had launched this survey in our normal timeline, the end of Q4, beginning of Q1, COVID hadn't, hadn't really hit us yet. And then as we were analyzing our report last year, COVID, and we did a supplemental survey and wrapped that into this webinar we did last year. This year, because you know we are still working through the impact of COVID-19 in our businesses, we rolled those questions into the survey. So we're gonna be able to talk to you a little bit about how in-house agencies are adapting to remote environments, how teams were impacted by the corporate financial decisions of the companies they're within, uh, how the team supported their company's response efforts. And then we've, we're going to see how that kind of tracks in the next year. And some of those questions may stick with us depending on what the lasting impact is. And other questions may get retired and new ones brought in as we do do every year. 
This year, almost 500 people responded to our survey, which we narrowed down to 360. That narrowing down process includes eliminating responses by non-leadership respondents, as well as uh, responses that were submitted by external agencies. In addition, we eliminate responses that we're able to identify as duplicative. So our goal is that each response represents one in-house agency and, believe, and we believe we've done a good job of giving you the insights of the senior leaders of in-house agencies because they're the folks who know best what's happening in their organizations. Each year we fe feature articles written by working creative leaders. This year, the first article was written by Matt Griffin. Blue House, it's the reimagined in-house agency at Chevron. It was born literally just as the pandemic took hold. One of the first orders of business Matt and the team at Blue House had to figure out was the process of getting work done in support of their new mission, right? Their new mission was to deliver more strategic integrated solutions. So in this article, what Matt talks about is how they ended the nose game of like, who, who has to do it, right? Not having to put your finger on your nose to be called upon. <laughs> um, and they did that through, in, in Matt's words, the dreaded RASCI process. Um, a lot of hard work that led to really good results. In the next article, Marin Tabora speaks to her experience leading the development and expansion of the in-house creative and brand team at Owens Corning. Previous to 2018, there was a team of, of about three creative services staff that existed there. And since then, Marin has led the team through a focused growth and services strategy to become a, a well-rounded strategic partner to the marketing colleagues. The third article, really like this one. We asked Mike to write this article because his team tackled what we hear so many in-house agencies struggling with, tracking rounds, and specifically tracking rounds within Workfront. So in this article, Mike speaks to how he and his team were able to dispel the perceptions about how long things take um, being a, by being able to point to the amount of time projects are at different points in the cycle, how many rounds each project went to, how much time it was with the creative team, how much time it was in review with the clients, and et cetera. And Mike and his team found opportunities to improve their own processes. And, and not surprisingly, some of that um, perception around projects taking too long was really the amount of time things were sitting in review and waiting for feedback. And then in this last article, Nancy Silverman speaks to the multi-year transition she led at Merck Creative Studios. They were shifting from primarily focusing on internal work to supporting brand work at Merck. And the results included being awarded AOR status for several brands. Specifically, Nan Nancy speaks to the talent strategy that she led, and that enabled the team to achieve her vision to provide Merck that increased value. As I mentioned when we got kicked off, I I'm really excited about what we learned this year. So I want to start about I'll start with talking about the story of 2020, give you a little more context to kind of what's got me so excited. Over the last 13 months, COVID changed the way we work substantially. And I know that that's like the biggest no-brainer statement I could make here today. Um, but something pretty interesting happened during this time. The majority of companies doubled down on their in-house agency investments and sought the in-house agency's partnership in communicating the company's COVID-19 response efforts and executing the marketing plans that had to be reset due to the implications of, of COVID-19. So it wasn't all good news, and I just want to kind of get this piece out of the way. One third of teams decreased in size. Typically, we see about 20% of the teams decrease in size. You can see 2019 on the left versus 2020 on the right. We went from 20% to 33%. But not surprisingly, the companies that fall into that 33%, um, you can guess the industries where most of them were. Oil and gas, travel, hospitality and entertainment, and sports and fitness. That said, we are starting to see a rebound in some of those in-house agencies within those industries. So, you know, knock on wood, we're on an upturn. And I, I addressed the monkey in the room about those 33%, but I'm not going to overlook the good news in this data. In a pandemic, almost seven out of 10 in-house agencies maintained their size or grew larger in effort to support their company's marketing and communi communication strategies. That's a big deal. So while we did have 33% of teams shrink or get smaller, right? 
for the most part, if you look at attrition, it's pretty much similar year over year here. You can see in 2019, um, in the dark part or in the bright purple and that lighter purple, that's about 80% of teams had 10% or less attrition. That number holds up in 2020. That's our standard. Almost 80% of teams experience 10% or less of attrition. But I'm gonna call this piece out right here. If you really wanna compare it and get down to where the switch happened, we the number of teams in 11 to 15% decreased at the expense of more attrition. So we really saw, you call it, you see it in the pink call outs, the percentage of teams that had lost 16% or more of their staff has grown um, 11% in 2019 to 20, um, I'm sorry, 16% in 2020. <clears throat> so same graph is here on the left, that same one we just looked at um, for 2020, all teams. But if I, if I take that data and I were to cut it just by the teams that decreased in size. That's what you see here on the right underneath 2020 teams that shrunk. These teams experience a disproportionate amount of attrition, which is I think within our expectations, right? Um, what we see is of the teams that shrunk, half of them shrunk by 10% or less, but half of them shrunk by substantially more. They got hit pretty hard. So interestingly enough, regardless of whether the team grew or shrunk, because we cut the data, we looked at it, there was an overwhelming trend towards workloads increasing. And the things that that can be attributed to is you know, supporting the COVID-19 response, um, marketing and communication strategies and messages, messaging being completely reset. And the third most popular one that we'll dig into a bunch today is that shift, the faster than expected shift um to digital right um it, it's it's a lot but here's when i take all those things into consideration everything we just went through as well as the additional learnings from this report that the full length report and then i add in um the anecdotes that i've heard across the past year i am excited we've been building to this moment for the past decade the value proposition of in-house agencies that includes creating great work um, speed, the timeliness of the work we do, the proximity to the clients or partners that we work with, being a right cost, not having a huge profit margin on top of the expense of our, our services, being adaptable. Oh my God, 2020, being adaptable. Um, and then being innovative, like all of those things that we've been building towards as a community across the last 10 years. In 2020, our number was called and we were ready. You know, Jackie, I would, I would perhaps add that our value proposition for our institutional knowledge is it should be right up there with it. I think that with reduced staff and perhaps reduced budget, um, we've been able to spend less time having our in-house agency folks being onboarded and the renewed company philosophies and their visions and the messages about how they needed to pivot. There was just so little ramp up time that we proved ourselves again being indispensable as an in-house agency. Absolutely. So, so let's take a look back. That, that's what we learned in the past year. That's what we saw happen. It, it was spectacular to be able to watch that from the sidelines and be a part of it with a couple of teams. What we see here is the reporting structure has shifted over the past five years. Previously, in 2016, eight out of 10 in-house agencies reported into some level of marketing and communications groups, right? They come underneath different um, versions of that, whatever that division is called in your company. Um, and conversely, 20% or it's 19 here, right? Um, reported to an outside group like shared services, IT, finance, we've seen all those things. And the shift that we've seen over the past five years is that more and more groups are actually reporting into marketing and communications teams, bringing them closer to strategy and into the decision making and part of the decision making of that strategy. You know, we've been seeing a lot of CMOs and CEOs getting closer together. Traditionally, we know that the CEO is really focused on that overall ROI with the CMO focused on the important acquisition and retention. Now those CMOs are actually aligning their objectives much closer with the CEO's financial ROI growth goals. And it's having an impact throughout the entire organization. It's a, drip, it's a trickle down effect in the greatest way. Absolutely. And it's just exciting to be this close to it. And we're seeing not only our teams being um, 
re reporting structure is changing, we're seeing a form of investment in the in-house agency in team size, right? So again, in 2016, almost six out of 10 in-house agencies or creative teams were 10 or less people, right? And very few were large, which we have listed as 30 or more people. When you shift over to 2021, you can see a much more even distribution. Companies are investing in their in-house agencies by growing them. Yeah, this is absolutely a nod to the institutional knowledge and the value add that our orgs bring. Um, the in-house agency's value is clearly front and center right now, and it just makes strong business sense for, for companies to invest here in these um, in-house teams. I'm not surprised to see such a large jump um, in the team size, and we're actually seeing it more and more with the, the companies that we speak to daily. We should offline put a bet on when that number is going to be largest in outside of small. To be uh -huh. <laughs> when teams grow, what we see happen is an operations role be carved out. So in smaller teams, um, the creative director and the operations lead are the same person. But right around when that hits 20 people is when we start to see the in-house agency divide those into two groups. A creative leader who functions as a creative director, leads brand, leads creative, and then an operations director who focuses on things more like finance, technology, process, et cetera. And just as teams have been growing, thankfully, we're seeing that same shift towards the inclusion or creation of operations roles. Again, we see this every day in the companies that we're working with. With that um, increase in size, you're going to have an increase in the number of projects that are coming into the group. So you're going to need to have more practical operational needs like resource management and resourcing. Putting a real um, eye on a close financial management and the budgets that are coming through and really leave that creative leader to focus on brand consistency, the messaging and the content to pull it through. If you get, if you get larger, you're going to need to split those two roles. Another trend, and Another actually this one goes trend, and actually this one goes in the opposite direction. In the opposite uh, direction. Oh, Sophie, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt us. Are you hearing feedback? Just a little bit, um, but I think it cleared up. Me too. Okay, good. Sorry, everybody. Uh, in 2016, a third of in-house agencies charged their clients back, right? Did chargebacks, and we're actually seeing that decrease. And I don't find this surprising. Um, what I think it aligns with is that shift from those groups that are outside of marketing and communications to uh, moving them inside marketing and communications. Because now that you're part of the family, if you will, you don't charge family, at least in my family, we don't do that. So it's, you know, so you're moving inside the house, you're serving and partnering with your own. There isn't a need for the, the financial transactions. There is value to charging. Okay. It, it provides the perception that uh, a perception of value that marketers really do appreciate. You know, there's a fine line uh, and a sophisticated balance you, you need to play into what you do charge so you don't end up being the perceived cheaper option rather than the most appropriate. There's nothing that you, there's nothing worse for your in-house agency than to get caught in bidding wars against external agencies. That's not the point here. We need to ensure that there is a perceived value um, and often applying a, a monetary value is the easiest and clearest way to communicate that. What it also does, right, is drive, drive behaviors. Like if you have a decision to make and you have limited funds, what is the right partner to do that work for you? And sometimes cost is part of that decision. This hasn't changed, that your team size is highly, um, there's a direct correlation between your team size and the likelihood you are going to be a chargeback department. And that's because, right, if you're a small team, you're kind of a drop in the bucket to your company as far as finances. If you've got five people on your team, your operating budget is less than a million dollars typically. Uh, if you're a 50 person team, an 80 person team, you're now looking at a $10 million, $15 million um, type of expense for your company. And so they start to put you underneath greater scrutiny and really just ensuring that the resources are used efficiently. And here's a look at that. Um, if, you, if you look at 2021, all teams, that's the same graph we've been looking at. But then what we did was split it out between if you're in Marcom, your likelihood to charge back. If you're outside of a marketing and communications group, the likelihood to charge back. And I know it looks a little funny. You're like, why did it only go down 1% in that middle graph? Um, and that's because of the sample size. Very large number inside the marketing and communications group. 
whereas you can see in the one on the right, the sample size is 21. And so it's not, you know, it's directional. It shouldn't tell you what to do, but at the point being here, those folks who are outside of marketing and communications, more likely um, to put in place a transaction uh, value to support their services and be able to balance who they support. Now here's the video, the growth of video capabilities. Five years ago, already six out of 10 in-house agencies were providing video. That has increased about 10 percentage points, 11 percentage points here in 2021, which is, I actually thought it would be more. It's, I thought that that growth would be much more on the present. However, I think the real story is in the type of work in-house agencies are doing. So if we look at who they were doing work for, in 2016, um, there was a, lar a pretty large percentage of work still being aimed at internal audiences. It was like we had training wheels on. We were still trying to figure out uh, how to do video, what we were going to do with it, our company strategy for video in their content strategy, like how that all worked together collectively wearing training wheels. Fast forward five years, the training wheels are off. Um, and, and now it's a lot more clear where video fits into a company strategy. And you can see that it's almost cut in a third, the percentage of um, in-house agencies who say that the primary audience for most of their work is internal. I love the analogy of the training wheels. I think it's, I think it's really, really strong um, because video capabilities, yes, yeah, they're absolutely growing. But what we're hearing as we speak to people is just how many challenges there are around managing the operations effectively of a video studio. And what are the even the, the industry standards or KPIs for the expectations of what should be coming out of those videos, uh, video studios? And I think that there's an opportunity here for um, for perhaps marketers to maybe bolster up on their knowledge of what channels are open, what can be done with video. I think that um, as well as not really understanding how to fully support your team from an operations perspective. There's also, you know, the lack of subject matter expertise in the marketing team to know what to actually deliver. This is one of the areas that we're witnessing some rapid growth marketing efforts. We're going to be mentioning rap, um, marketing, growth marketing throughout today, but video is definitely one of the channels that we're going to be keeping an eye on. We just have to help figure out how to support those studio teams so that we can maximize this channel. Kind of switching gears a little bit. Uh, Let's talk about project management systems. Those of you who have known me, I've been here at Sela now 11 years. And I think for 11 years, I've been on a soapbox. My colleagues at Sela have been on a, on a soapbox. And a lot of folks out in the industry have been on the soapbox. And it's the soapbox that says, you need a project management system. Uh, and we've seen substantial change. I, I should have gone back and put the 10-year 10 one, 10 year one in here just to kind of look at those numbers. But I just think it's fabulous, right? 67% in 2016, all the way up to 87%. We're basically at nine out of 10 in-house agencies are using a project management system. It's fantastic. I'm, I am a massive fan of project management systems. That and process are my two kind of like happy places. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about this chart is um, looking at the folks who, um, who grew their in-house agencies and hired an operations director. Because an operations director would want to be able to count some stuff. They would want to be able to um, measure what's going on and manage their resources um, appropriately. I think this could be a really nice place for us to go back and look and see if there's a way that we can find some kind of data match between these two uh, reports. Absolutely. There is something different we did do this year with this data. I'm going to bring that up here on the next page. What you see kind of faded back on the left is the data we just looked at. However, we've broken it out a little bit more here. For the first time we asked people, we said, not only do you have a tool, Yes, we have one. Then we gave you the option. Yes, we do, but we're not happy with it. Uh, no, we don't have one. No, we don't, but we're actively looking for one. And then the option I give every year, and I, I don't know why we still do, but the paper, tic paper tickets and other manual methods, which I'd love to have an offline chat with someone how that worked in COVID. Uh, but that number's gone down. Um, anyway, what I want to double click into is the yes, but dissatisfied. That comes down to, like, of the people who have a, have a tool, 25% of them aren't happy with the tool they have. Yeah, dissatisfaction is rampant. Again, another area that we have a lot of conversations with folks about. And I think that you can really 
place dissatisfaction of the tool in three main buckets. The first bucket is the, the, the tool selection. Generally, um, creative teams get to have input on the tool that they want to use. Um, you understand what your unique uh, needs are uh, and understand the actual repercussion of each of the features that you're asking for. When IT sees the list of requirements that you have, on paper, it might look very similar to um, an, another tool, perhaps a marketing tool that's being used in place. And they'll try and make you um, take that on in place of a, a true workflow tool. So that's one area that we do see a lot of um, challenges and dissatisfaction, which is unfair to project management tools because it's not really a PM tool, but that's for another day. Hmm. The second area that I see um, challenges with is um, folks often bring in a workflow tool, a project management system, thinking it's really going to fix the process that they have. The challenge here is that if you have a process challenge prior to implementing the tool, all the tool's going to do is put a massive spotlight on where your issues are, and it's not going to try and help you fix them. Um, you'll need to have uh, somebody come in, or, or you'll have to look at your own processes and see where they can be fixed. Remember, your workflow tool should be supporting your process, not be the process. Um, we find that if you fix them before you implement it, it's so much easier to get a successful adoption. Um, and then um, fixing it while it's in place can happen. It's just going to be tough. And people are only going to remember that they don't like the tool. They're not going to remember that they don't like the workflow. And the last bucket is really um, change management. So when you think about implementing a tool, be it project management or, or any other tool, success is 95% user adoption. Doesn't matter how great a tool is, if nobody's using it, it's not, it's not a successful uh, rollout. So change management allows you to really figure out um, how to get the best adoption with your team. And there is cultural evidence and, and issues, there's process issues, and then there's again, the what's in it for me issue to try and get there to, to get successful adoption. So Sophie, I'm gonna recap um, three keys to satisfaction, selecting the right tool, addressing process before you implement that tool, and then actually having a plan for change man management and adoption. Absolutely. So another tool that we look into every year are digi digital asset management systems. And I first saw this data and I was a little bit disappointed um, because I looked 64%, like how is it only, how is it that less than two thirds of teams, only less than two thirds of teams are using a DAM system today? And then I took a step back and I said, wow, look, at th there actually is a substantial increase between 2016 and 2021. So I think that number is good. But the problem, I, I, problem's a strong word, um, but I think the challenge for a lot of groups is they're not really using a true dam. Because when we dig in and we say, so what system are you using? Uh, the top answer is SharePoint. The next one is Adobe Experience Manager. That's exciting. But then we go into Dropbox and um, another file share like that. We're not talking about the true capabilities of a dam system and the impact they can make for your in-house agency. I, I have to wonder if this response isn't really more due to how we're asking the question. People are obviously storing their assets somewhere digitally. I, I, think, that, I think that it's too narrow on the field of specific digital asset management and we need to make it a wider field to allow any kind of technology that allows you to store and share access to assets and that may not be considered a traditional dam. Well, there's some homework for yourself. Yes, evolve the question. <laughs> the answer is right. evolve the question. <laughs> um, another one, now you'll, you'll take a look at this five-year trend. It's not a five-year trend. And that's because five years ago, we weren't talking about agile in the marketing and creative industry. So this is just a look back from two years ago. The first time we asked, you know, are you utilizing Agile? And in 2019, if we could, you know, think back to it, Agile was like on the cover of magazines, the headlines of posts we were getting in around Agile and marketing. That's like the next biggest thing. But the challenge was we were having a really hard time, like figuring out how to fit it to creative. Um, it, it wasn't this lift and shift from the IT Agile, uh, at least it didn't appear to be um, for most of us. And then I, in 2021, look what's happened like i think we have figured out how to make agile work for us not a lift and shift but an appropriate application of agile in our worlds this isn't surprising 
I don't think right now, just due to the amount of remote work that we're doing and how we're currently required to make work happen. Um, I also think it's in no small part due to the amount of growth marketing efforts that we're seeing across all industries. You know, when team members are remote or they need to work in cross-departmental ways, the collaborative and the iterative nature of Agile is just a perfect fit. Um, I think that this number would be higher if we described how people worked and didn't use the word Agile. When I speak with people and I say, oh, you're using Agile as a process, I often get the answer no, and then the person will describe the Agile process perfectly as how it's work done. So, um, you know, I think that we're figuring it out. There is a process out there that you can just slip right into and make things so much easier. Um, you don't have to reinvent this particular wheel. But yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not surprised that it's increasing. I, I would love to see it go up a little more, and I'm sure it will. Well, that, that's a good segue, Sophie, that what this impact of COVID-19 has led to, um, in addition to Agile, well, let's back up, if you will. It's the idea that we're all working from home. We've already talked about that. Um, 80% of us are still doing it. Hello from the DC suburbs in Maryland. Uh, Sophie's here from Northern New Jersey. 80% uh, of us were working remotely full time. You see 18% partially and 2% are in their offices basically full time. I did, out of curiosity, dig down into that 2% to say like, who's actually working in their offices um, full time? And it does tend to be smaller organizations. Uh, I think, you know, that's probably a generalization I'm going to make, but Fortune 500 companies tend to be less risk, adver risk adverse, employ a lot more people. It's a lot more difficult for them to move back to office. Uh, but the, and the majority of us are working from home. You know what's kind of funny? Um, and it might just be a, a, a coincidence, but 2% of people have to be in the office and 2% of people didn't have any kind of project management tool. Not say I'm going to geek out on the project management tool, but perhaps if you didn't have to pass your paper along, you could do that from home too. Yeah, that, that's a new data cut we have to do afterwards. Uh, so how's it working out for us? Early on, when we surveyed last year, people were su surprisingly pleased. People were pretty excited about um, seeing productivity and quality maintain, if not improve. And a year later, they're still telling us the same thing. You know, 29% say it, productivity has increased. 62% say it's consistent, 8% seem negative, but when we ask a little bit about why do you think it's going down, still most of those factors tend to be around things that hopefully will be different sooner rather than later for us when, you know, when it comes to maybe taking care of other people in the home and things like that. Um, quality has also improved for about a quarter of the people and or stayed consistent for the majority, right? So all this is saying is like, this is working. Um, I'm going to go to the next page because the next page tells us again something that we've been hearing over and over in the um, environment is that it's here to stay, right? Um, a lot of people have said we were already kind of here. That's what you see at top with that 3%. The 74% are like, are saying it, it's, we're going to increase. We weren't doing this before this way, but we're, we're still going to have office hours and we're going to have a lot more flexibility. Um, the 17% said we always had a lot of flexibilities. Yet this 6% down here, um, they're saying we gotta be back in the office. And I can appreciate there might be some examples of that, but what I worry about for those 6% is that they're going to be at a recruiting disadvantage, at least here in the near term. You know, the recruiters in our organization, they're telling us that candidates are asking, what are the return to office plans for that client? Um, you know, and what does that mean for me? Do I have to be there on site in, in, in six months, in three months, whatever? Um, but I will also say, this is my stripe on the beach ball, that's a phrase we say here at Zella. Um, I think the pendulum has swung really far to the one side, that people, this remote work, everyone's working from home, like, can we go all the way? I think eventually, potentially having that office presence is going to be attractive to candidates, people going back to want to separating home and work again, if maybe not five days a week, maybe just a few days a week. But right now, people are being very cautious about accepting positions that are going to require full-time on-site presence. So what are the concerns about this? If this is what we're doing, if this is the new or the next normal, as I think McKinsey uh, coined it, what are the concerns we have about this? Um, the big ones that we see here, right, it's maintaining and building culture and creating relationships with, with colleagues. Uh, 
I get that. That's actually kind of my concern, which is a little bit ironic because a lot of the team members that um, are within my scope, they've been remote their entire careers with Sela. And we have, I mean, I hope I'm not wrong here, um, but I think we've got great relationships. These are fantastic people who we enjoy getting together when we can, and we work remote most of the time, even prior here. Uh, there are 17% of people who say they have no concerns. They think this is gonna work just fine. Um, and maybe it is. I know, I know you have a different point of view, right, Sophie? I do, I do have a little different point of view. And yes, for the record, we do have a great culture. <laughs> I think everyone does like working here. Um, but I, I, for me, one of the most interesting aspects of remote culture is how it's, it's truly impacted by age and generation. And again, I'd love to slice the data to see the age of the respondents. I know we don't capture that. But Gen Y and Gen Z, or the iGens as, uh, as we call them, already live in a fully remote cultural society. They're playing their games online, they're going to school virtually, most of them. Gen Xers are probably some of the most open-minded and change-ready um, folks out there. When Gen Xers started work, it was about faxing and um, phone and, and the mail. And, and they've had to shift their way of working to right now, working virtually through Zoom and they're fully on email. I think it's going to be the earlier generations that are going to have the tougher time. Um, those who have um, done their whole business based on face-to-face -face interactions, business deals over lunch, things like that, I think that's going to be a little tougher. But I do believe that we're going to age into a, a place where having remote culture is more widely acceptable. I think it's really fair. But here's what happened, right? All these things we're talking about here, remote culture, um, what we've moved into, and we weren't the first people to say this. This is, you know, a kind of common sentiment. But what happened is five years of digital transformation had to occur in one. It got compressed. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was speaking with a gentleman from a procurement team um, at a Fortune 500, and he was working in China at the time of, um, uh, I guess it was, was it swine flu or, or SARS, I guess, I think the first version of that. And regardless, he said what happened in China was this compression of digital transformation, even though that was 10 years ago, that's what it created. So he was predicting that in its current format um, here. And he was absolutely correct. It, it forces you to work within what's available. And the way we saw that manifest here in the in-house creative industry is in the type of work we do. For many years, we've been kind of benchmarking the split between print and digital work. And this year we broke it out even further and the results are dramatic. We've never seen people say print design, you know, down plus down significantly, a 62% of the team say it's down. It stayed consistent for about 30 and only a few had to go up, which was interesting. I'd love to hear those stories too. But look at those purple boxes within up significantly and up. Um, even video live action, well, and what we mean by that is like, you know, filming people in a time in a pandemic where we had to do six foot social distancing and all, all, everything else that was probably put into place, that still was a priority in the work that the in-house agency did. I love how neatly this ties in with marketing moving towards growth marketing and increasing the focus on those micro moments. These platforms that are seeing the greatest increase are the direct target channels for taking advantage of those small connections with consumers with a specific goal of changing or confirming a customer mindset. These are our growth marketing channels at their best. And, and I think it just ties right back in. I'm a big fan of growth marketing, by the way. <laughs> they, have, they haven't picked it up yet. Um, so the people, our people have made this possible. In, the, in your in-house agency, your people are your greatest assets, right? And when we think about the challenges of in-house leaders, and and their teams these challenges have remained pretty consistent year over year these are the ones i'm looking at this year uh having enough people having the right skill sets having the right roles on the team in, in 2020 we made we had to make do with what we had and it, it worked out really well um we we probably asked a lot of people to stretch and try new things um and whether that can be consistent um and in, like grow with the business, I think we need to watch it carefully. There's a time where, you know, as we think about the new heads that we get to add to our teams, 
we need to be looking at do we have the right team in place and what changes do we need to make now that we have the luxury of a little bit more time and hopefully a little bit more money. I think this also raises a really good question, sorry, about um, choosing whether or not you're going to be hiring channel specialists or having folks who are able to think a little bit more channel agnostically um, and who are able to put the content before established expectations of the, the, the channel delivery. Absolutely, and I think that'll even like ring truer when we get to that slide about talent scarcity. Um, here you can see most in-house teams are expect that they'll stay about the same size in 2021, though four to 10 say they're gonna grow, uh, which to me is not surprising at all. And how they're gonna grow, they're gonna add headcount via contractors, almost half of them. And then 37% are gonna grow with both employees and contractors. And then 35% say we're gonna be hiring employees. Uh, so all of that is good news. Like those folks are hiring. And I, I love to see that mix of employees and contractors because it creates flexibility on the side when you hire contractors and employees allow you the advantage of being able to grow institutional knowledge in a different way. I'm calling this second, our second term of the roaring 20s. After an extended period of social and financial restrictions, I think people are just going to let loose. They're going to be shopping, investing, traveling, and entertainment. Those industries are about to get a pretty big boost. I hope so. I can't wait. Uh, so talent scarcity, we ask this question all the time, like which positions are you finding harder to place, which ones are a little bit easier? And the majority response, um, for the most part, is there's enough qualified talent to choose from. Um, however, when I look at it really when it comes to uh, combining those two columns on the right, there's limited qualified talent and I'm having trouble identifying talent. That's the majority response when you combine them becomes different. UX designers, I know we are hiring a ton of these on behalf of our clients and it is getting harder. Copywriters are becoming more scarce. And then also motion designers and data analysts. These are the roles where people are starting to struggle. And so it kind of related to the housing market, at least the housing market by me, it is a seller's market, right? And in this analogy or metaphor, talent, they're the sellers. They have their choice of things right now. Um, and so if you're not able to provide a attractive offer, whether that's compensation, whether that's a room what the remote work policy is, your benefits, um, we know that the uh, millennial generation is about purpose in their work, like that's going to be harder to kind of capture these folks. And then what are the types of folks that we believe we're going to need more and more of, right? So what type of work are we going to be doing more and more of? And the top areas that each of you have indicated as our areas for growth for your in-house agency, more digital design, more video, more social media. And the one that I think is really exciting is this one right here. And I know Sophie is so passionate about it. I am. This is going to be in response <laughs> to marketing efforts. In-house agencies need to absolutely be prepared to staff and work differently to support the coming wave of what's going to be art of marketers um, in the next year or so. Um, I, I am very excited to watch this space and see what happens here. So Sophie, what else are we excited for? All right, let's just take a quick recap of what we believe are some of the key shifts we're seeing in our industry. There is a clear shift um, of in-house in -house agencies, sorry, moving to report to marketing and communication groups. We have seen how large companies have embraced the in-house agencies and depended on our institutional knowledge. In addition, they've depended on our willingness to be adaptable, to be flexible, and they've maximized on our key skills to get the important work done. Our teams are growing, even through a pandemic, We've experienced investment into our team's headcount, and we've had the requirement to work across disciplines. So therefore, we're seeing an uptick of agile work streams that are absolutely tailor-made for our multi-touch point and iterative work. Digging a little deeper into agile, we have witnessed that while the large majority remains around the same, a combined 36% relied on agile either more or substantially more, again, demonstrating that collaborative nature that our work has taken on. Last year, 
we watched our workflow transform from a classic waterfall or the passing of the baton method of working to an environment where we all know our common goals and we play our part to achieve them. I believe we're seeing this due to that shifting mindset and the expectations that's happening at that C-suite level. The closer a CMO is gonna to get to the growth vision of the CEO, more sense it makes to bring creatives even closer to their marketing partners. We need to make sure that the creators are ready for what they need to create and then how they can work most effectively. For the first time, we actually asked this new question um, and it's how much time do you have with the CMO? And again, we're evolving our questions as the, the, the industry is evolving because we believe that we're gonna to start to begin to experience what our C-suite are shifting towards today, an increase of direct communication on a weekly or monthly cadence. That minority 22% is the section I think we should all be really eagerly watching. I wanna see how that transforms year after year through this report. Um, and those who are not able to meet the CMO directly, we discover that in-house leaders have still got a seat at the table, but perhaps they are um, speaking to someone who is a direct report to the CMO. Again, it depends on how large your company is. But this is one more nod to the expectation of how growth market, marketing is going to be relying on all parties to come together to work towards that common goal. And, and clearly, Sophie, we know that some of the folks who take this survey work in organizations where they don't have a CMO or either a head of marketing. So when you think about this question and you apply it to yourself, are you speaking with the person who provides that type of leadership for your company, whether it's communication strategy or in higher ed, it's sometimes like institutional advancement, things like that. Like, are you connecting with where the strategy is being set that you're delivering against? That's a great point. Um, and it's definitely something we need to consider. But yeah, you need to look for the strategic lead of how growth is being um, strategically laid out and measured. Absolutely. So this question we have asked for the last 10 years, but as our industry evolves, some of our questions do too. So this has had a little bit of an evolution. Um, this year, we asked you to categorize your department just a little differently. Not just about how, you know, are you a tier one strategic partner to your marketing team? Are you just doing tier two and three executional? But we really wanted to better understand how teams could evolve to support the content teams uh, and be seen as an integrated growth marketing partner. And those content teams are popping up outside of in-house agencies um, and they have creatives and writers and channel agnostic strategists. Um, and we really wanna be able to see how the in-house creative team who already have access to these, these talents can support the marketing organization. You'll see here that this categorization may uh, need to evolve some more, but the 9% of teams already demonstrating the support of these new skill sets and ways of working, I do truly believe that it displays that we're on the right track with what's coming next in-house agencies. You know, Sophie, what we used to do as an industry um, was evaluate our maturity as in-house agencies by the amount of tier one work we were doing, right? And what I'm hearing from you, and, and, and um, I'm buying what you're selling, <laughs> is that it's time to shift that mentality. The work being done in content teams to develop what we would traditionally have called tier three, tier two and tier three creative assets, um, because the creative isn't new concept, but the strategy behind those pieces, that's where there's customers to be won, um, value to be created and money to be made. So tier one can no longer be that litmus test for be being considered strategic and driving high value. It's not that you don't do those things when you're doing tier one, but there's other ways of achieving those outcomes. Exactly, exactly. And I think that basically sums up, Sophie, why we're so excited about 2020 because the, this industry, this community of leaders, like have positioned in-house agencies to do this. For sure. And, and we know you all, this, uh, we, we used 50 minutes for this piece of, uh, for the presentation here. And we know what you're really excited about is the entire report um, that will be released public next week, but you guys get it early, of course. Um, it will be sent out to you by end of email or by end of week in an email. Do note, it doesn't have an attachment. You actually have to go through the email. Um, you don't have to go through the firewall. 
uh, to be able to download it. But we know if we made it an attachment, it would get blocked by all of your servers. <laughs> so that's coming. Look for that this week. Uh, you can dig into the footnotes and all the little, I know in the definitions that we just went through with those new ways the in-house industry or agencies can be kind of defined where they are in that spectrum. Very small text on that page. You can dig into it into the book. It's 60 or 64 pages. And I guess the book is a relatively outdated term in the PDF. Uh, so with that, we're gonna hit our Q&A. We've got 10 minutes to do so. All right. Um, I, don't know. I have one here. What types of roles or activities do we think line up best under an operations management team? That's a great question. So, you know, we really want to separate the client facing traditional account management folks from the creative folks to the folks who make sure stuff gets done. So we're really looking at under operations, um, project managers, maybe perhaps traffic people. Um, if you have independent resources and um, folks who decide where work comes in, how work comes in, how work gets distributed to the teams. It's really, we want to leave the um, the creative execution to the creative experts and be the people that try and manage how work gets moved through. So your classic kind of PMO um, or even your um, governance team, if you don't have a large in-house agency, you may be somebody responsible for governing how um, work gets created and the standards that you're looking for. And those are the kind of roles you want under operations. I'm also a big believer yeah. in creating operations from account management. I think it's you can't they should be there should be healthy friction there. I, I would agree with you there. There's a couple of questions that are related. Um, the first one is project management systems can be a broad term. What do you qualify as a project management system? That's from Benjamin. Yeah, for sure. So it can be. The ultimate goal of a project management system is to steward the work while you're tracking where the work is through the life cycle of that development. So we're really looking at tools that allow you to intake a project and say, these are the requirements, this is what I want. Tools should be able to say, these are people, the resources who have available time, they have that demonstrated in the tool. Um, that, that tool then is able to capture the task list of what your resources are supposed to do in order to create that deliverable. Um, and then, and be able to capture the time and the level of effort that's being put against that particular task or project. Um, the project management tool also really should be able to provide reports so that you can see if you're estimating appropriately or you need to shift that or how you need to charge back or uh, account for um, our allocation. I would also say that when you're looking at a project management tool, there are some bells and whistles that you may want to have in there so depending on your needs, you might want to have an integrated routing tool that you can keep your notes on and have historical data in there. You may want to tie it into a, a system, a, a dam system, or a system that allows you to maintain your assets electronically and pull them through. Again, we're looking to eliminate any kind of manual labor where there's a possibility to um, have human error come into play. So what we really want to do is have that tool do the heavy lifting and allow us to do our best work without thinking about those things. And, and one, a couple of folks asked a similar question, uh, what are the most common project ma management tools used? And, and this year, the market leader for in-house agencies was Workfront with 38%, and then really quite a distance lower in second place at 14% was Microsoft SharePoint, which clearly is an adapted tool to, and doesn't necessarily achieve everything you would achieve in a tool like Workfront. And then we see um, answers such as Jira, Write, Trello, Smartsheet, and Asana, rounding out the top five or six there. There's a great question here, Jackie, about um, if it's possible to speak about the benefits of Agile for creative and marketing teams and the differences from Waterfall. I can absolutely touch on this. I have a slight passion for process. So what, um, the way that Waterfall works is that you have a project manager who basically tells the next person what to do, tells the next person what to do. If a creative or a person on that chain of instructions has a question, they ask the project manager and the project manager finds the solution for them. And I think we may have lost. Keeps the project moving. The project manager is responsible for keeping the the continuance of the project. 
manager per se, scrum master who brings everyone together. So everybody comes, is accountable for, for getting the information that they need and for solving their own problems and if they're unable to solve them using one another, rather than oh I, I don't know if I'm frozen Jackie am I frozen you're, you're okay now you are going in and out oh I'm sorry um, I couldn't decide if it was me or you to be honest um, well, let me take it from here. I'm going to move us a little bit just because right now my Wi-Fi is uh, winning. Um, there's a couple more we have an opportunity. I will share. Uh, Dawn shared, um, and I think this is awesome. My Fortune 500 company um, is being recalled at 50%, and she's an art director and going back at 100%. So definitely starting to see some change as, of course, vaccinations become more prevalent. Um, another question. Oh, what a good question. Um, how many people or what what does n equal for this survey um so 360 or it's about 364 um were the the sample size that we narrowed it down to and then when you get into the report adam and others each individual question actually has the sample size the n equals right next to each graph so you can understand how much the data is i think like when you get to the chargeback information you can see it's a pretty small n whereas other places you're seeing 250 300 350 etc I'm hopeful that I'm back now. Am I back? Yes, you are. Um, there's a question here, a great one about creative roles being moved into marketing roles. And um, I think that as we're talking about these content teams, what we're seeing is our marketers coming in and they're being engagement strategists. They're using data that they're finding out about very small personas of the audience to do rapid er experimentation as to um, how to better engage with the user. Uh, in, in what's known as a micro moment. And what we're seeing is that creative directors are being pulled into those content teams to partner with the marketer or the engagement um, manager to really understand what's possible and to be more experimental and push the boundaries of what creative is, pop is, is able to do. The reason content teams are, are popping up is because the way that work happens is so different, it's so fast, and there's so much um, iterative uh, feedback from the data that comes in to putting something else out with limited reviews, um, it's hard to get that kind of rush turnaround done in a large um, in-house agency that's not prepared for it. So it's a great question because we can get prepared for it and we can set ourselves up to be those content team partners that the creative team, that the um, marketing team is going to need. Uh, we are, we got two more minutes, being to a couple more ones. Um, Let's see, uh, is web development included in IHA work or is it separate as a type of work? Uh, Anna is asking that. And I think it's either or, it's funny. I think the same things, but kind of a little bit of a different storyline, but we were kind of struggling with in 2005 um, and, and in 2000, does anything digital fit in IT or does it fit in the, the in-house agency or the creative teams as we probably called them back then? Um, now development is kind of fitting into that same question. Is that an IT function or is that an in-house agency function? I think it really depends on the organization and the depth of the development, how deep of back end it is, how much it's interacting with other systems, the marketing stack or outside the marketing stack. Um, I don't think there is a steady um, or consistent response for that. Sophie, anything you would add there? No, I think you, I think you covered it. I think that's great. I think that's completely fair. Awesome. Uh, Deshaun asked a question that I think may have been cut off, but I'm going to try and guess what you were asking there. The question is, are the salaries keeping pace? Um, here's kind of the trending we're seeing with salaries, right? And it's a little bit too early to tell, but clearly I said it's a seller's market. So, and, and we're, we're entering into some inflation. So we're going to see some upward pressure on compensation. Um, the other thing that we're going to see is how this dispersed workforce, right? People who were formerly living in California, a woman who um, I know who's a leader in an organization was working out of their offices in, in California in the San Francisco Bay area. She just moved to North Carolina. She's still working for that in-house agency, right? But 
clearly a very different cost of living. Um, how do you need to work near where you live and vice versa? That's going to probably change what compensation looks like over time. Um, but right now I can say things are going up because the talent market is tight. Um, and with that, we're hitting two o'clock. I imagine most of you, like many of us, are back to back and don't get that five minute break that we had in high school to move between classes. Uh, but Sophie and I truly appreciate your time today. We look forward to additional questions you may have. Um, there's a couple in the in the chat box that we can follow up with some folks on individually. And if there's anything Stella can do to support your organizations, to help you find that talent that's scarce, um, to augment your workforce, to be consultants to support you improving your technology, uh, working on your org structure for the future. If you've got a challenge and it's within the creative marketing and digital space, we'd love to be your partner. Uh, thank you so much for your time. This webinar will be available in a, record, in a recording uh, later this week or early next, and the report's gonna hit your inbox later this week. Thanks so much. Thank you.